little hot here, huh? There you go. Well, good morning, everyone. All right. Um, this is kind of uh, out of character for me, isn't it? Usually I'm up there doing that, and, and everybody else is doing this, but I'm going to be touching on missions today uh, because it's very important to know who our missionaries are, where the church came from, what our part is in all this, you know, and, and one man's vision, basically. Okay, so let me see. Other than the obvious people, um, well, let's, the, the one who is sent on a mission, especially one sent to do religious or charitable work in the territory or foreign country, or one who attempts to pursue or persuade or convert others to a particular program, doctrine, or a set of principles. That, that's what a missionary does. But anybody know who this is without the obvious people? Yeah. <laughs> this is A.B. Simpson. Do we know who A.B. Simpson is? He, he is the founder of the Niagara, or uh, not Niagara Alliance, but the Alliance Church in general. So what do we know about Mr. Simpson. Well, he's one man with one voice and one mission. And that mission was to reach the world. And, um, whoops. He graduated from Knox College right here in Toronto, uh, which is really weird. So, you know, like when I was reading up on him, I had to go back to school to learn how to be an optician years ago, and, and, and my English teacher made me write a bunch of stuff that I did not want to write. And then one day she said, okay, you guys got to have a two and a half page paper on whatever you want to write it on. And so I chose to write mine on A.B. Simpson, because I figured if you're going to force me to write papers, I am going to witness to you. And uh, I learned quite a bit about E.B. Simpson back then. So it was, it was fitting to know that he took a job right here in Hamilton, Ontario, at the Knox Presbyterian Church, right over the border. That's not too far away from us. Now to think that the founder of this church was that close and yet we didn't know it, that is amazing. There's a lot of things he didn't know. Uh, he took a position at the Knoxville Presbyterian Church in Hamilton, and he was there for eight years. That church grew by 750 members in just eight years. Now, Pastor Dan would love to have 750 extra people in this building. Times were different back then. They, they, were, they were looking for uh, a reason to get into the building. But during his ministry, the church grew um, by, by the 750, then he was called to Chestnut Street Presbyterian Church out in Louisville, Kentucky. So he went from a nice little small church because he didn't think it was big enough, and he took his message to Kentucky. Now, that, that was a fairly sizable church. The thing with that is in the first three years, it doubled in size. And he was there for five years total. So it doubled in size, and then... Two years after it doubled in size, he left. Why did he leave? Well, he went to New York City to pastor a big Presbyterian church in New York City. And I mean a big, big church. That's what his mission was. He wanted to see the people from the streets come in. So much so that he led 100 Italian immigrants to Christ. So the congregation suggested that they uh, find a different place to attend church. It was then that A.B. Simpson felt that God was leading him to a different calling in New York. So the thing is, back then, uh, the congregants paid for their, their church pews, you know? You walk in, you see these immigrants all sitting in your, your seats. I mean, what are you going to say? hey, I, I paid for that seat. Why, why are they sitting here? Why, why don't you let them go find another church to go at? Um, and that's when he realized, oh, hold on a minute, your heart's not in this for missions, you see? And if we're here to fulfill the Great Commission, what does that tell us to do? It tells us to go 
and make disciples. It doesn't say sit here and hope that they come walking through your door. It says get out there and do it. Now, he took his, his message into the public library down there, and, and there's a whole, if you've never read about A.B. Simpson, it's an amazing story. But he was basically a, a street preacher. He would go out on the street and bring them in because that's what he would do. But now, according to the CMA website, November 1981, A.B. Simpson called a meeting inviting all Christians who sported an aggressive spiritual movement and only seven showed up. So take a, let, let's go back to his previous church where it grew by 750 people. Seven of those people only showed up for the meeting. We're talking New York City, though. That church was much bigger than this one. But that seven accepted the challenge. And from that little church, well, we'll call it little because he eventually ended up leaving that one. Uh, but he, it was an aggressive spiritual movement to reach New York City's overlooked non-believers, and only seven of them showed up. And within a few years, A.B. Simpson and a small band of followers, they planted the Gospel Tabernacle. Now, back in the early part of the church, they, they actually did tabernacles. They didn't do, you know, the small churches that we see nowadays. It was mostly these big things. So... Uh, he planted the gospel ta tabernacle in the heart of the city, and that outreach ignited a passion with him to take the message to distant lands. So now here you have a whole field of people that are coming into New York City, and it's ripe for the picking, you know? And he chose to, to listen to what God was saying to him, that there's, there's a whole world out there to advance my message, and you're the guy I'm going to do it through. So that um, message turned into the Missionary Training Institute, which was the American Bible, um, first American Bible college. And out of that, he had five of his graduates ended up going to the Congo. So there's your first missionaries from the Alliance Church, out the door and out to, to the Congo. Um, they were working there, and the Missionary Training Institute would later become Nyack College. Now, who's familiar at Nyack College? <laughs> those that went there, right? Nyack College is right in New York. Um, but, you know, if you didn't know that that's all part of the Alliance Church, um, you just found out. You know, that's, that's a mission. He's now turning people, young kids, into missionaries through the college. But he formed two organizations. And in 1987, the uh, Christian Alliance was for believers to experience a deeper life in Christ to fulfill the Great Commission. That was the parent body for the Evangelical Missionary Alliance. So as you can see, in this just short period of time, well, short period is probably about 15 years, um, he's gone from Hamilton all the way out to New York City to creating a couple um, bodies of, of believers. Uh, the uh, Evangelical Missionary Alliance was focused on spiritual empowering the Christians to serve overseas missions. The two groups merged together in 1887 to form the International Missionary Alliance. So we went from these different branches down to this one branch now. And then the early church branched out to their local communities who gave to the Alliance Foreign Missions, and they sent 180 workers overseas. You know the amazing thing about those workers? Two-thirds of them were women. And they opened 12 new foreign fields to the gospel access. And after uh, A.B. Simpson had passed, Dr. Paul Rader led the now Christian and Missionary Alliance, and many of the CMA tabernacles sprung up in many U.S. cities and across Canada. In all, Dr. Simpson had penned uh, about 101 books, and over 172 hymns. A lot of those hymns we, we still sing today. So that was one man with one voice, with one mission. And he's created what we are today. But out of that, we had this guy. Anybody know who this man is? Tozer, very good. A.W. Tozer. Oh, uh, 
A.W. Tozer was, um, he, he did a lot of writing. So if you, you get your bulletins, uh, and he would have a lot of sayings on the backs of, uh, of the bulletins that were A.W. Tozer writings. Um, he never attended high school or college. So um, I guess back then they, they brought him a lot smarter than what we are today, you know, uh, because uh, this guy here um, changed the tabernacles for traditional church buildings during that time period. It, it was called the evangelical area between 1947 and 1974. Uh, they continued to expand the CMA uh, locally and globally, but, but they had changed those big old traditional tabernacles for smaller churches. And two people had a great influence in that alliance, and one of them was uh, Dr. Lewis King, who, f who was a former missionary to India, and he created the strategy to develop oversee, uh, overseas CNMA churches to become more self-supporting. So other churches that, uh, that have missionaries go out, they have to raise their own funding to where the Alliance Church, uh, we train our missionaries to go out, and we actually support them, but we, we support them and teach them to work yourself out of a job, basically. Because if you're doing the work of the Lord and you're doing it properly, that church will grow so, so much that you won't be needed there anymore. And we'll see this a little later on. Uh, CompellingTruth.org says this about Tozer, that he had never attended high school or college, but he read a wide variety of books. Most of them were religion, philosophy, literature, and poetry. And um, he started out in this little storefront church and in Nutter, uh, Nutter Fort, West Virginia. Um, Nutter Fort, never heard of that at all, but West Virginia's not that big. But he went there and, and started a church there. And it wasn't long before he left that church, just like A.B. Simpson, he ended up going to Southside Alliance Church, which was in Chicago. So uh, that's where he spent most of his time. But in his first 11 years that he was there, the number of his congregants grew from 80 to 800. So it's, it's pretty amazing how, you know, you get somebody that has a mission, that has a, a, a passion for the people, how, the, how they can grow a, a congregation. And if you have the support of the church body, th that helps, you know. So from there... Um, he remained at that church for 30 years before he uh, answered a call to pastor the uh, Road Avenue Church in Ontario, or Toronto, Ontario. Um, there's another one that ended up going back to Toronto, you know. It's pretty amazing how two big influencers of the Alliance Church were, were from or ended up in Toronto. Uh, but he penned more than 40 books that, that are still available today. And he also became the editor of the Alliance Weekly Magazine, which is now called Alliance Life, uh, right up till his death. So if you've gotten any of the Alliance Life uh, magazines throughout the years, uh, especially the earlier ones, he was the editor of that because he would have his own articles that he would put in there and, and people looked forward to, to reading these things. It was very... Um, spiritual for the people that read them. They, they really were moved by them. So if you've read anything from Tozer, you'll know about that. He had touched so many and have reached the masses over the years, but there are others that, that are notable to mention. Uh, Billy Graham, D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday. I mean, there's a whole list of, of great evangelists and those that, that had a passion for a mission field to go out and reach the people. I think we all know about Billy Graham's ministries, right? His big crusades. Uh, we also know about his offspring. We do it right here with OCC. Uh, Franklin Graham is also reaching those in, in other countries uh, with the same gospel message. So it's not just us that reaches out. That There's a wide variety of people, but it takes all of us, all of us to, to reach the four corners of the earth. But now let's take a look closer look to home. Everybody know who that is, right? Um, for those that don't know who uh, Mike and Ruth Ann are, Ruth Ann actually attended the uh, uh, Niagara Falls Church, 
and grew up there until she met Mike and decided that uh, she didn't like us anymore and left. But no, I'm kidding. Ruth is fantastic. Mike is fantastic. Uh, but I, I reached out to her and said, hey, can you give me the history of the Davises in their mission field? Um, their beginning was in Moon Township, Pennsylvania. Uh, so they, she grew up here. I think he was in Pennsylvania. And, and when they got married, they went there, and they ended up going to West Hills Alliance Church, and then they left in 1986 to leave for Brazil. So they had the passion to head out. But, boy, do they have a long list of things they've done over their time. From there... Uh, they would call it, uh, in 87, it was the beginning of the Brooklyn Alliance in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then in 1994, it was the beginning of Vela Madalena in Brazil. I'm, I'm going to butcher these names because, you know, I, I don't know the language very good. But they were there, but then in uh, 1999, it was the beginning of the Tadalupe. Is that probably the way I say it? Um, and then they stayed there for quite a while. They were there until 2007 when they had the beginning of the Alpha Vale in Brazil as well. So um, they worked hard there. I mean, Brazil was very good mission field for them, but they've opened all these churches and, and spread the message. But, you know, it made that good. They trained the church to be self-sustaining. And then in 2010, they worked themselves right out of a job. That's what the missionaries do. So imagine that. You've gone now and you spent 20 years of your life in Brazil, and now your mission field has been closed by the Alliance because you've done such a good job there that they're shutting it down because they're growing on their own. They no longer need Mike and Ruth Ann there to do, to do their things. Not saying that they're not appreciated, but... Let's face it, that's, that's what God wants you to do. Go out and create that mission field to bring people in and to expand his message, not ours. Because if we do our message, it's going to be terrible. But his message will grow the church. So they, they leave, and now they arrive in Portugal. Because they weren't ready to retire. Although they had the opportunity to retire, they decided, no, I want to continue to go, and so... They chose Portugal because the language is fairly close, so they didn't have to do a lot of studying to learn how to, how to speak. They just needed to learn the dialect a little bit better. Um, Pastor Mark was talking about Thailand uh, when he was there, that he got something backwards, and the way he said it just was totally opposite of what it meant, and it was very embarrassing. But uh, this is why they, we, we train our missionaries to, to learn the language so that you don't go there and, and make mistakes like that. Uh, we don't want to divide the people. But they worked themselves out of a job after 23 years in the field, and they opened several sister churches there uh, as they gave the people the tools to self-sustain the church without them. So the Christian Missionary Alliance had officially closed the mission field to Brazil. So they go to Portugal, and in 2017, they begin uh, the Paradise Church in Portugal, and as far as I know, that's where they're still at. Am I correct? Yeah. So, so they are still there right now. Um, so if there's any downsides to this, Ruth Ann says that uh, if there's downsides to their history, it would be these notes, that the church in the Moon Township closed after 32 years, so their beginning is no longer. And then the Tadalupe Church closed last year after 22 years. Uh, but they are thankful for us a as a congregation here and across the country uh, for holding, them, uh, holding the ropes for them and praying and giving because without our support, they wouldn't have made it this far. That's, that's the way the missionaries feel, all our missionaries. Uh, the ones that we've had here just recently, uh, you know who they are. They... they depend on our support, so that's what we look for. So now how about if we get a little bit closer, shall we? Everybody remember these two, right? I mean, they took off and went to a um, uh, mission field in Brazil um, through the Word of Life Ministries. 
because Kendra just had this passion that she wanted to go in the mission field, and she happened to meet Jeff, and Jeff shared that same uh, passion to go out into the field. So they went to the uh, Word of Life Ministries out there, and although Kendra would have to stop chasing her dream of being a missionary in Brazil because of an illness, uh, she was just suffering with migraines terribly, and they couldn't figure out what was what was wrong, you know. So they they just kind of figured that when I say they, it would be the doctors. If I remember correctly, they thought it was because of the the, the weather is just too hot, and that's what was causing it. So uh, Kendra was really no no good to. Uh, Jeff, because, uh, you know, those that suffer from migraines know that a lot of times migraine will take you right out, you know. So um, having having support by, by your spouse and the people around you is huge. So they had to leave the, the field and come back home. But that doesn't mean it's over with. Uh, they are currently serving right now in Connecticut and Rhode Island. They just did something in Rhode Island here not too long ago. Um, but they're fulfilling the dream here, you know, because let's face it, uh, the field is here. <laughs> it's all around us. We just need to to look for the opportunities to go. Um, they served uh, right here in the U.S., and they're currently serving here, but the mission field is ripe for the picking, because you know what? Not all missionaries go abroad. Yeah, stop and think about that. Not Not all missionaries go abroad. Let's take a look a little closer, shall we? Anybody know who these two are? You know? Um, I know, I know. He's the pastor. He's supposed to spread the message. Um, but since he's been working outside the, the church, uh, he's been very bold in saying why God has put him here and, and where he is now. Um, the witnesses that he displays has a ripple effect. We feel family picnic. Wegmans, uh, he's talked about how he missed Red, an employee here not too long ago in his message, right? But once he realized that, hey, I'm going about this the wrong way, he, he recognized the mission field and went for it. So that opens more doors for him. And of course, we all know how he helps with stuff with uh, Operation uh, Christmas Child. So those are our local missionaries that, that are here. Um, how about even closer than that? Oh, look. Boy, we got Phil and Vicky. Sorry I'm picking on you guys. But you guys are pretty instrumental in, in quite a few mission fields. One is the Niagara Gospel Mission. Once a month, feed the homeless. Vicky and her sisters will um, help at the clothes closet. And, and what does that do for people? I mean, it's a mission field. These are people who are in need, and they're fulfilling that need by reaching out. They don't turn their back on them. They don't say, eh, you know, can you have them go look for a different church? Nope. They got the A.B. Simpson approach of, I'm here to help, and I'm going to go help. We feel family picnic as well, the clothes closet. College, boy, we've heard about Vel and his college things here and how he's reached out to certain people, and um, it's a witnessing tool. They, do they know who you are? They will when you open your mouth, right? You don't want to hide the fact that you are who you are because that's a mission field. College is very ripe for, for a harvest. And then visitations. When, uh, when Deb was in the hospital, um, quite a few of you have... Uh, stopped by or reached out or called and sent cards and prayed. That's all part of the mission field. Uh, although we're all part of the same body, you've reached out. And, and without that, uh, you know, you, you, you're left out to wonder, what, you know, what's going on in life, right? So we needed that. But then guess who else is there? We got Chuck and Robin. Boy, we all know about them, right? Another one that... We feel family picnic. Oh, see, we see a, a, a pattern here. You know, the we feel family picnic is huge for us because it gives us a chance to get out there and, and tell the story of who we are without actually proselytizing, right? We just go out and we demonstrate what it's like to be a Christian, and they will answer questions. 
NGM as well. Um, you know, they're part of the crew that helps feed. And uh, she helps with Vicky at the closed closet. And they also uh, visitation. They came up to the hospital while Deb was there and, and sat with her because we didn't know if they were going to be able to move her uh, right away or not. So we didn't want her stuff to be left in the hospital. So they, they went up there and sat with her for uh, a few hours until we found out the answers. And they also have an outreach. Now, what kind of outreach does he do? Well, geez, Chuck took on a project here with uh, Tim and, and others. Uh, Danny, uh, I forgot who else went with them. But they, they who? Oh, and Val, yeah. They, uh, you know, they repaired a sign over at the uh, Lions Club here. Uh, not only they repair it, they, they rebuilt it, they, they painted it. It looks wonderful. But that's an outreach, you see? And, and that's what we need to be. Boy, we, I, everybody sees a pattern here, right? Oh, anybody know who this is? Right? Luann would, would never sit here and think that she's part of this process. But you know what she does? She also comes to the NGM. She works with people who have had addictions. She's, she's drove many uh, guys here uh, to church because she's, she's found a mission field out there and she's reached out to these people. Doesn't turn her back on them. She reaches out and says, hey, listen, there's a need. I want to help you. Is that, that's what a missionary is, right? And then there's Dan. Boy, we know Dan as well. You think, wow, he's, he's been having problems here recently. How could he be helpful at all? Guess what he does? <laughs> Same thing, you know. You go out and you're talking to people who are on the streets and they're coming in for help and they're listening to your message of how you became a Christian and they're open to it, you know. Dan's an encourager, I got to tell you. He made a phone call when uh, Deb was in the hospital and I was with my thoughts because God only knows that when you're in your thoughts, you can get lost and, and, and dive, you know. Dan just loaded me up with a lot of stuff that, you know, I wanted to tell him to shut up because you're bugging me, but I could not deny that the things he was saying was, whew, man, it cut right to the heart, and I needed that because the enemy was sneaking in, and, and he cut those cords to get rid of the enemy. Mission field, because he'll talk to anybody, <laughs> you know. John Owens is the same way. You put John Owens out on the street, he will talk to the grandmas, young kids, anybody. I've done there's Alan and Heather. It's another crew that I try to guess where they help out at. Ah, yeah. Same, same thing. I, I'm not just picking on that, but these are people who are reaching out to those in need. But he also has a little coffee ministry as well. You know, sits down in the morning with a bunch of people, a handful of people, one person, it doesn't matter. And he will sit there and talk to you forever. It's, it's a good little ministry. It, being available to others to let them know that you're important to the mission. He's also an encourager during the time that I'm sitting up there. Who's sending me text messages? Alan's sending them. Who's sending Deb messages? Heather, <laughs> those messages are very encouraging. Now we get to Janice. Who wouldn't think this was going to happen, right? Where do we see Janice working? She does a lot of visitation as well. Um, we feel family picnic, prayer, transportation. She's, you know, uh, willing to help out uh, Chuck and... Robin and, and Vicki and Val, they also uh, are good for helping people out. Uh, she sends the cards. And the cards you get from church, guess who they come from? Come from Janice, you know? She was a youth leader. Bet you didn't know that. And if you did, you probably didn't know what kind of youth leader she was. If you're familiar at all with Ray Boltz's song some time ago, it was called Thank You. Oh, yeah, I forgot she was a Sunday school teacher. I forgot I had so many other ones here. We feel family picnic as well. 
and the youth garage sales. Oh my God, the youth garage sales. If you've ever been a part of youth garage sales with Janice, she took those way too serious. Um, me, I, uh, I got in more trouble than the youth did, but that's a different mission. Um, but she's also a seamstress, and, and her mission is, is talking to those who she does the work for. So the song, thank you. The, the first verse in this says, I dreamed I went to heaven, and you were there with me. And we walked upon the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing, and then someone called your name. You turned and saw this young man, and he was smiling as he came. You guys don't know who this young man is, but you'll see who it was. Does anybody know who Jonathan was? <laughs> Family, they, you know, they, they better know who he was. But I'm sure Janice knows who he was. This is a young man that uh, was right straight from the streets. When, when our youth group got down to two kids, I, I would still be showing up for youth group even though I had tickets to the Sabres game. And Janice would say to me, go to the Sabres game. Don't, don't come here. It's only two of them. I can handle them. And I said to her, Wednesday is for the youth, and my commitment is to the youth. So I will be here. And um, when I realized that none of our kids were coming, I said, well, if they're not going to come, I will go out in the street and pull them in. And Jonathan was one of these that came in. So... Uh, Jonathan joined the youth group, and he wasn't always a very pleasant character, to say the least. Am I right? There's, there's been times, but he was never disrespectful. Uh, that's important to know. And you're taking a kid that's had a lot of problems uh, and, and things in life, but he was never disrespectful. May have had some issues with some of the other students, but, but he was never disrespectful to us. Um, he wasn't always committed either. Janice would say to him, hey, Jonathan, are you with us today? And if he said no, she would say okay. And then she would continue with class, and never once would she call on him. But you know, deep down inside, she knew he was listening. Because, you know, Jonathan, he would put his hood up, and that was it. It was ugly. He, he had some spirits that were... We're battling him pretty bad. Then the song continues, though, and um, it says, and he said, friend, you may not know me now, but then he said, but wait, you used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight, and every week you would say a prayer before the class would start, and one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart, and then it goes on to say, thank you for giving the Lord, for I'm a life that was changed. Thank you for giving the Lord. I'm so glad you gave there was a youth event that happened every year that we went to. Um, it was put on by Youth for Christ at the time, later turned out to be Joshua Revolution. And it went from December 27th through December 30th. And what most people don't know is that Janice spent her anniversary <laughs> every year with the youth for about 15 years. It could have been longer. I, I, I don't know. I got into it a little, little late. But I was with Janice for 11 years during this but you know it, their anniversary was on the 30th and I'm sure I know I was wore out when I came back from it she still you know just ventured on but keep this in mind the event went from 7 o'clock on the 27th until like 2 o'clock on the 30th now that doesn't sound too bad except that Janice had everyone packing coolers and coming together so that we could be to the hotel by 3 o'clock. So even though the event was local, we experienced it like everybody else. That event branched out three countries and over 6,000 kids, 7,000, somewhere in that area. Um, we had help, too. We'll, we'll get to her in a second. Um, but she would pack the coolers and be there by 3 o'clock, and then we didn't get to bed until midnight most times. Uh, but the following morning, we would be up around 7 o'clock so we could eat and be ready to face the day with the first uh, power session starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then we would go back to the hotel and eat lunch. And from there, we would travel to local restaurants that were away from the event because Janice felt that 
the people that came in from out of town, they, they don't know their way around. So we would all pack the cars up and we would take off with the kids and head out to uh, the restaurants that weren't immediately around the hotel. And um, then we had to be back for the evening session until curfew was at 11 o'clock and then we would uh, discuss the day's happenings and what we're gonna do the following morning. So what a better witness to the youth can you get than somebody reaching out to the youth? But then there's a, a more to the song says, uh, then another man stood before you and said, remember the time that a missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway, and Jesus took that gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. So now, think of that, you know, the missionary come in. I'm going to bring Cindy up here. Um, if you guys don't know who Cindy is, come on up, Cindy. We had a missionary come to our church one day, and um, we were doing a, uh, <laughs> a blowgun and, and her son, she told her son, just just blow the thing. Don't inhale. And he said, okay. And he, <laughs> he <laughs> like this. And all I seen was this dart dangling out of his mouth. And she said, didn't I tell you don't inhale? Uh, it was one of the funnier moments. But Cindy here, our group got to be so big that, that we had to split it up. And Janice and I took the senior class. And Diana Clayton and Cindy took the juniors. And, and the four of us uh, really had some, some good times. Um, but Cindy here was, was my partner in crime because Diana would lead, Janice would lead. I would cause trouble. Uh, she was still okay. Uh, I was the one who was in trouble. But go ahead. I like to give honor to God and the pastor and first lady of this church. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here for Janice. I've known Janice about 25 years or so. She's been sewing for me for like 25 years. She was Sam's youth uh, leader, mm -hmm. which he really gave her a hard time. <laughs> we come upstairs for, Sam would ask to go to the restroom and he'd go home. <laughs> and I wouldn't know to after service. But Sam enjoyed being with Janice. They went to, um, the hotel with Janice. I went one time and that was enough for me. I never attended again, but it's an honor to be up here for Janice. Mm. She's done so much for the community, so much for the church, and she's always there anytime I need her. Janice is still sewing for me. She's sewing for my sister over there, and we really love and appreciate Janice, and she's there every time we need her, and I'm so grateful for that. Amen. Thank you. So this is part of our crew here. Uh, I wish I could say I could bring all the crew here, but, you know, we can't. Do you think I reached out to a lot? Absolutely. I, I'm not saying that Janice is the best one out of all of them, because we all have a, a role to play in the mission field. Uh, I just wanted you to know exactly what she has done throughout the years and the commitment that she's done. Let me see, there's breakout, you know, um, Sunday school class, you name it, you know. But you know, the funny thing is, Cindy was also a missionary and didn't even know it. Sorry, I, I didn't tell you you were going to be in this, but you're in it. You know what Cindy did one day? She had a neighbor who passed away. And um, there was a couple of girls that were left there. And, and she would be looking out all the time and seeing these kids were in need. And she said, hey, is it all right if I bring in these girls to the, to the youth group, you know? And no, we, we said, no, nah, absolutely not. We don't want them. Are you kidding me? They were wonderful to have. And Cindy would drag them in. The other things that Cindy would do, if we needed somebody uh, to help, shuttle kids down to an event that we had to go to and we didn't have enough vehicles, she never hesitated. She brought over the van, we packed the kids up. At one point, the youth group was 25 strong, so we had a lot of kids and we were packing them in there. But this, this, is, what, this is what you're to do, you know? The mission field is, is very ripe right now for the harvest. We just need to be the ones to get out there and do it. But she gave the girls a chance to get 
their minds off of what happened to their mom. Plus, uh, it gave them something to do with the others in the neighborhood because a lot of the kids that were, were there came from the neighborhood as well. Uh, some of our best and worst times uh, together were during this time. Uh, we had lost one of our, our youth out of the youth group. It was before I was in it. But Janice had the task to talk to that crew, you know, and, and I remember coming out of church and we were standing outside talking when the youth came up from, from the basement. Every single one of those kids would have quieted the football stadium by the looks on their face. But Janice had to reach out and, and, and touch a subject that was, that was very devastating to the, to the youth at that time. Uh, and we've had a couple uh, friends also die, but that one was part of the youth group. Um, so... Uh, she was in touch with the youth on a level that is hard to do with the generation gap that, that was there. Um, what made us good, though, she grew up in the church. I didn't. Um, so here's, here's the other thing to this. The last part of the song says, I know that up in heaven you're not supposed to cry. But I'm, sure, I'm almost sure that there were tears in your eyes. As Jesus took your hand, you stood before the Lord. He said, my child, look around, for great is your reward. Do you know how many people you touch? Look at Chuck back there. Chuck traveled all over the country, and, and he would, uh, uh, you were in RV sales, right? And, and Yeah, and he would he would witness to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's Chuck was explaining what he's he done over the years. The thing with that is though. He was always available. You know, doesn't Scripture tell you to always be ready to have an account? You know, if somebody said anything to Chuck, he would open his mouth. And, and he'd be proud to say who he was and, and what the mission field was. But what made us a good combination was that she grew up in the church and I didn't. I was from the streets. And um, I got to know Christ in my 30s. You know, I wasn't very good. I was a heavy smoker. I apologize to Janice all the time because she had to deal with that. Um, I would know uh, what the youth were in just by the conversations. And she would address, address current issues that affected them at the time. But in reality, we took the Great Commission to heart. Although we could not phys uh, physically go to other countries, we had a huge mission field right in our backyard. All of us, we have a huge mission field. Right now, her, her ministry did not stop there. She has led a group of ladies in the Sunday school class that outgrew the classroom. I mean, literally outgrew the classroom. Um, I was with the men, she was with the ladies. They were, they were packed. Ours was like being, we were in the fellowship hall basically and she had a classroom. I said, why don't you switch rooms with us? Nope, she wouldn't do it. Why? Because it would take out that, that personal feeling that she had with, with the ladies. They were such a tight-knit group that they did not want to uh, break that up at all. But she continues even today by leading breakout. And, and although she used to do it with just the women, it's now a combined class of both the men and women. So that's what a missionary does. We don't always go abroad. A lot of times we're right here. Um, oh, geez, I forgot a whole bunch of this, didn't I? Um, yeah. Boy, did I, I just kept talking and said, oh, I, yeah, I need to get back to those. This is what Jonathan said about her. Uh, she made me feel a part of the crew because I wanted Jonathan to come here, but he works. So he couldn't come in today. And this is what he said. I said, if there's anything you want to tell her, what would it be? Um, he said, he made me feel part of the crew, even though I was from the streets. Uh, she always included me in activities and in Joshua events, and she even talked me in the Bible quiz. And boy, if you knew Jonathan, to know that he was in a, a, a quizzer is amazing. 
But he says to her, she always treated me as a person and not like a madman from the woods. Even though a lot of times he came in and wanted nothing to do with it, she never turned her back on him. Cindy never turned her back on them. You know, we've all had times where you'd want to just throw your hands up. I'm sure Vel and Vicky have times at the mission where you want to throw your hands up and you feel like you're not doing anything. But all it takes is one person. When one person hears the message, it could turn out to be like A.B. Simpson. You never know. And the last part of this song says, Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad that you gave. This is for all of us. It's not just for Janice. It's not just for Heather and Ellen, Vicki and Val, and Chuck, Cindy, myself, Pastor. This is for everybody. Every time we do the Lord's work, we're, we're doing a mission field. And one day, when, you're, when you finally get to meet your maker, and you'll have people, well, I don't know. I'm going by the song. You'll have people that come up to you and say, Wow, you don't know the impact that you made in my life. Um, one day I was getting out, uh, going into to Value Hardware, and I hear a scream, and, and I turned around to have some girl latch onto my head and near about tear my whole head right off. And the grandmother said to me, boy, you must have had an impact on that girl's life because she seen you the minute she got out of the car. And all she wanted to do was tell me she got accepted to uh, bus, uh, was a University of Buffalo. Um, that was uh, Holly um, Weiss, and, and Dottie Klein was, was the grandmother. Uh, Dottie, for those who know her, she used to be a part of the church. She now goes to the Lockport Alliance. But that was her granddaughter. But you, you don't know the impact you have on people until sometimes years later. So now, you want to know what a missionary looks like? It's pretty easy. Look around you. Look at the person to your left. Look at the person to your right. Look at the person right in front of you and behind you. These are the missionaries that never have to go abroad to spread the gospel. The Great Commission says, And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. That concludes my message. I hope that um, you understand the importance of what it means to be a witness to those in your neighborhood, in your communities in your work, in, in the parking lot. Doesn't matter where you're at. The Lord's commanded us to go out and make disciples. This is our mission field. We need to continue the vision that one man started over 100 years ago. And, and with that, I will yield the mic over to Pastor Dan and Holly. Uh, but let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord for this opportunity to come before you and to be able to share a message of, of what it's like to go out and do the work that you've commanded us to do. Uh, we never really fully understand that it's us that could have the huge impact on the world. We always think it's, it's the big names and, and that um, we have to be some supersonic person that just does a million things. But in reality, a simple phone call to encourage people, uh, a simple act of kindness of, of bringing stuff to somebody in need, a simple act of kindness of just giving a ride to somebody that needs it, and reaching out to those around us who don't know you. We ask, Lord, that you will put in our heart that, that mission field that you want us to go and, and that you will give us the words to say and the things to do. And we'll thank you now, Lord, and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Nick.